Hi, I'm Jason Alster, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Author. Tonight, we have Jack O'Neill as our guest. And Jack wrote the book, 21 Work Strategies, a primer to ready today's high school youth for the world of work. And the book is about, for goodness sake, don't make the same mistakes that I did. Use this book to ensure that you start off on the right foot when you enter the world of work. Let me help you by serving as your mentor. I promise not to tell you what to do, when to do it, or how to do it. Instead, allow me to present certain strategies that will allow you to make a smooth transition from the classroom to the working environment, a place where you'll probably spend upwards of 40 plus years. Now that's something most people don't even realize is that four years of high school and you need that for the rest of your life. Um, let me just read one review before we get to Jack. <clears throat> I like this review a lot. It makes no difference where you work, be it at an office, bank, oil rig, school, airline, specialty store, hospital, warehouse, food and beverage industry, etc. 21 work strategies holds true regardless of one's place of employment. Just looking at the table of con contents made my mouth water. Oh, what I wouldn't give to have had this knowledge back when I was in high school. And let me just read some of the things in the table of contents that the book 21 Strategies deals with. Fearful, follow the footsteps principle. Start a love affair with your dictionary. Beware of vipers in your midst. Compromise is not a dirty word. You must get along with others. Help others be a volunteer. Seek advice, counsel, and feedback. You can't paint over rust. Don't be a kiss-ass. Be a realist first. Get rid of bad habits. Know when to back off. 50 points to ponder. And many more. Well, Jack, that sounds great. Tell us, how did you get to start this book? Well, thank you, Jason. I'm very happy to be here. Over the years, I've worked with a lot of young people. Uh, early on in my career, I worked in the Hartford Parks and Recreation, parks and playgrounds, etc. I've worked as a corporate recruiter where for years I did an awful lot of uh, working with young people, recruiting, bring them into uh, the world of business. I've worked with the Connecticut uh, National Guard in a special program called About Face, trying to get young people just out of high school to understand how important it is to get ready for the world of work. And you know, Jason, speaking of the world of work, I know in my book I said young people are probably, from the time they get out of high school, are going to work perhaps 40 years. I think it's closer to 50 years now, Jason. I really do. That's correct. I actually have a friend who is retired and he's the age 70. And because he couldn't live on his retirement pay, he actually had to go back to work. That is so true. And young people today, I notice they're academically ready when they go into the world of work, even out of high school or during high school with a part-time job. But they're not ready for all of the strange nuances that occur in the workplace. Unlike the classroom, things are quite different. And so when I put together these strategies that Jason went through very nicely, it gives me an idea to tell them, listen, I can't tell you what to do. I made a lot of mistakes, but I'm hoping that you won't make some of the mistakes that I made. So I settled on 21 work strategies. When I started the book, I was up into 57. And then little by little, I reduced them down to what I consider to be some of the important ones, Jason. Um, looking back over the years, would you say it's harder nowadays at the workplace or it was harder in the past or there's not really, like each time has its own? I'm going to say it's a much harder today. It certainly is. When I, in my day, there were a lot of young people who had mentors friends that could help them, people that helped them to get into the world of work. But today, you go into that world of work and they expect you to do A, B, and C, and you better be ready to do it. 
but it's not the quality of the work or the quantity of the work. You know, it's this ability to get along with others, to be a multitasker, to juggle at different jobs, etc. All of those things go into play, Jason. Um, very interesting. Well, as someone myself who has worked in many different jobs, and I'm also self-employed, um, I found this book intriguing, and I've had to learn for myself about half the things this book dealt with, and if I had known, and it took me years sometimes to find the answers, but if I had known some of the issues, what to watch out for, or be prepared for, it would have been really made life um, easier, because you do go through stresses at work if you don't know how to solve a certain issue. Um, one question I do want to ask straight out, if you have the answer or not. I'm not sure if it was directly in the book or not, but how to deal with difficult, difficult people at the workplace. It's not the, uh, it's not the easiest thing to do. I will say this, Jason. In my counseling background, I'm a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Connecticut, a former EAP director for uh, the Department of Correction. The issue usually is not how hard the work is, how tough the supervisor is. The main issue in the world of conflict and stress for many people in the workplace today are other people. Difficult to get along with other people. All of the little problems that are created. And you have to be able to get along with other people today. There's no doubt about it. When I started work, I was given a job. I was to told to do A, B, and C, and I did to the best of my ability, A, B, and C. But today, you're part of a team. Work is coming from another area. It's coming into your area. There may be three or four people doing it. It's pushed on to another area, and you have to get along with other people. It's the hardest thing to do today. Um, I agree with you with that. Myself, I had worked self-employed for many years after I worked with the team. And then when I had to go back to the working for other people for a while, um, I found that that was a major issue, working as a team when you come from working as being self-employed. And you do have to learn very quickly or else you're in trouble. And your experience and your knowledge about your job is important, but getting along with others is very important uh, nowadays. You, know, you have to do that too, I agree. Absolutely. Um, Name a strategy in your book that you'd like to read maybe apart from or you thought was one of the most important strategies. I think one of the most important strategies that I've had to deal with myself, and so I'm going to use it today, is, well, I have so many here, but I'm going to use the 21. word. 21. <laughs> yeah. When in doubt, seek advice, seek counsel, and seek feedback but not from your friends and not from a co-worker. It's okay to go to a boss, a supervisor, a manager, whatever you want to call this person. He or she is there to help you. They want you to accomplish your task. But young people has, have a tendency to be a little reticent, a little laid back. They're not sure. They don't want to expose themselves to a supervisor and say, in essence, I'm not sure how to do this. But you need to do it. You need to do it. Because you're going to build a bond between you and that supervisor. And that supervisor is going to know that you're the person that can do the job. But you need to ask questions. One of the hardest things in the world for young people, whether you're in high school working part-time or during the summer or, or in your first full-time job out of high school, you have to ask questions. Okay, that's also very important. That's correct. Um, is there a particular way of asking your question? Yes. Indeed there is, Jason. You don't want to go up to a supervisor and say, I don't know what to do. You told me to do A, B, and C, but I'm not sure. When your boss gives you an assignment, never walk away from that assignment if you don't know the four parts of it. The top, the right, the left, and the bottom. <laughs> You need to know what it is. I learned the hard way myself. I would get back to my desk. I would grab a pen and a pencil. I would start jotting things down. 
and say, now, what did she say now? What do I think? And I, I wouldn't be sure. So I learned a very valuable lesson in my first day in so-called corporate America. And corporate America can be anywhere where you're working. Always carry a pen and a small pad with you. I've had bosses give me assignments while I was on vacation. I've had bosses give me an assignment when we took a timeout from a team volleyball game. So you need to be able to understand. And when in doubt, ask a question. And the best way to answer it is, I understand this is what you'd like me to do, and I'm going to proceed this way. How does that sound? And then you'll get feedback as opposed to saying, I, don't, I can't remember what you said. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I've had bosses tell me, where's your notepad or bring your notepad with you. And, you know, they tell it to you the first time, but they don't really want to be bothered over and over. Their time is valuable, too. So they don't want to repeat it to you if they told you already the first time and you should have had your notepad with you. That's absolutely right. Um, I also have now a smartphone where I actually, if I have a problem, I'll film <laughs> the whole thing. And uh, that's okay, too, you know, as long as you get it down. That's quite, it's quite later. acceptable. And then, but if they didn't give you the right instruction, then you have it on documentation where you can say, but you didn't tell me that, <laughs> in a jokingly way. Well said, Jason. I, you know, there have been times when I have been given assignments, and I was afraid because I didn't want to show a weakness in front of my boss or my supervisor. But I learned another valuable lesson that I have in the book, too. And it's called Follow the Footstep Principle. I say the footstep principle is no matter what happens in the world of work, someone has been there before you. They've been there before you. They've had the same trials and trepidations that you have. So please, don't worry. Follow those footsteps. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. But you can imagine a high school junior working for in a summer and relying on some co-workers that may not be giving him the straight skinny, the straight poop, the straight information. Always deal with a boss. Always deal with your supervisor. And another valuable lesson I have in the book too, Jason, is your supervisor, your boss, may not always be right, but your boss is always your boss. So be very careful. Um, I agree with that one too. There are people... <laughs> Uh, definitely. Um, and the boss is there to, I mean, their job is to be your boss. And therefore, if you don't ask them questions, then they're probably thinking, well, I'm not a good boss because they're not asking me any questions. So there's really nothing to fear from asking your boss questions and asking for help because that's their job. Absolutely. To help you. And if you're avoiding that because you're afraid to show them any weakness, well, that's a mistake because, you know, people don't realize this, but... <clears throat> and it's not just about work, but it's also about life. You cannot be afraid. There's always another job. And sometimes you just have to say, if it's not working out and the boss is not doing their job correctly, I have to get up and go. And once you solve that issue and be prepared to get up and go because you have the skills and you set money aside, um, either way, then you can deal with the people you're working with. Uh, so you do have to have that ability too. Um, and not be afraid. Uh, very good. What about, I know it's, you mentioned the thing about the dictionary, because my mother used to always say to me, uh, look it up in the dictionary. Well, my mother always <laughs> said that too, Jason. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the strategies I have for young people today in high school, it, it's entitled, Make Love to Your Dictionary. Early on, I learned the hard way. It was so easy to sit and my mother would always be in the kitchen, the best one to help me with my homework. And I'd say, Mom, how do you spell this? Or, Mom, how do you do this? Or, what word should I use? And, of course, mothers being mothers always came through and helped. But little by little, as I moved from the 6th to the 7th to the 8th grade, my mother would say, it's time for a dictionary. And my mother was in the working world herself and one day brought home a book entitled A Secretary's Dictionary, something like that, Jason, mm -hmm. I recall. And I started looking up words, and I learned early on, if you have a good grasp of the English language, uh, you look up words, not only will you become a good speller, but you'll become a good writer because you'll see how to do this. 
Once, when I talked with some young people about the dictionary, they said, yes, you're right. I need to know some of those eight, ten, or twelve letter words. And I said, you're making a mistake. I'm not asking you to use big words in a sentence. I'm asking you to use the good English dictionary language, but have a good grasp of it. Nobody today can get through without writing. I know we all use our smartphones, our cell phones, whatever, but I'm here to say, when you get in the world of work, your boss is going to ask you for some definitions, uh, some examples, uh, give an overview of a plan that you're working on, whatever, and you have to write all of this up from scratch, you know, and you need to be ready. Um, that's very interesting and it's true. Uh, you, you also, people today, they have blogs. They have their own blogs, they're on Facebook. You know, you are writing for the public to see you. And if you make mistakes, they know you can't spell, um, even though you have spell corrector. Or if you do not use proper grammar, you know, you are out there and people see that and pick it up right away. That's correct. I'm going to make a very quick plug, only because you mentioned that I didn't plan on plugging this. But you talked about having proper writing, but also proper handwriting, even though today we're typing more and more, but you still have to use your handwriting. And that's important for finding a job because just like diction, if you don't have a nice handwriting, uh, people can see that and they judge you based on your handwriting. So I had, I had happened to put out myself a movie, a video, it's called Anyone Can Improve Their Own Handwriting. And when I was looking for applications for that, one of the things is I, I realized and I found out that, like you mentioned, job applications you have to know how to write and you also have to have a nice handwriting because you still have to do many job applications. You have to write an essay with your handwriting. Very good. Um, absolutely, absolutely, Jason. You know, for over four years I was a corporate recruiter and uh, some of the jobs that I recruited for uh, were in uh, food service, uh, entry level jobs, mail room, etc., messengers. So I had hundreds of interviews over this, uh, over this four-year period. And I would look very carefully at that application. And so many of them from young high school people or recent grads were printed. And you talked about not Hand having, mm -hmm. handwriting. Handwriting is, do you think handwriting is going to become passe again? Never totally. Never so told it's always going to be there in some, in some aspect. You need to have a good sense of the handwriting. And may I say, speaking of applications, fill out every block on the application. Never leave anything empty. Never leave a date empty. If it asks for salary, whether it's by uh, salary or per hour, put it down. When you're describing the jobs that you've had in the past, even if they're part-time, you must give the dates, everything. Goodness sake, I would look at applications about three or four minutes before I would have the young person come in and sit down with me. And I would have this in front of me, and I would say, listen, I'm going to send you back out to the, uh, to the waiting room. I need you to finish the application. It wasn't finished. And for goodness sake, be careful of the spelling. One of the things that I learned early on, and I passed on to young people too, if you're looking for a job in a particular company, call the company and ask if they'll send you an application at home. Tell them you're interested in applying. Most companies will do this. And then I used to take the application, make a photocopy of it, and rough out the application before I did the actual one. And I hope young people consider doing that today also. Uh, putting the work in and be prepared because they want to see that you put the work in. And if you can't even fill out the application, how are you going to do the eight-hour day that they're going to give you? Right. So that's definitely important. If I can ask, and I don't know if you mentioned it in the book or not, but you did mention if the application asks you what, you know, what salary you're looking for, how do you judge that? There's only a couple of ways that you can judge it. Uh, number one, if it's uh, uh, a salary, they will usually put down what it is. But when you get out of high school and get into college, a lot of the jobs that are posted today will not 
give the actual salary. It may say low 40s or low 50s. You don't know what it is. But you have to go in there knowing what you need to do the job. So if somebody is coming in as a food service worker and, you know, there's a starting salary, but you can move up and it's okay to ask, what will, they, what will that salary be in six months or a year from now? It's important to know. You don't want to walk in and say, I'm not sure if somebody says, what do you think you expect? Or what do you think you should be receiving for this job? We well, have to go a little on the high side, but not too high, not too exorbitant. And I'm going to tell you, because we brought it up, and this is important for people looking for a job, and it's my own experience, uh, people believe that when they go in for a job and for a salary, they believe that, well, let me go at the lowest salary, and then after three months, they'll see how great I am, them, and then they'll increase it. Nope. <laughs> what happens is, you, your most valuable period is right before you get the job, when they want to hire you, they're willing to pay a certain amount to get you on board. But once, and then they also have to set aside those monies for the year through budgeting or whatever to get you at that salary. So you now cannot go to the job and change it after three months, you know. So you have to get the proper salary up front or not take the job or take the job at the lower salary. But don't think you're going to be able to negotiate it after a while. So do your homework ahead of time, what you're worth, and your strongest point is before you start the job. Once you start the job, you no longer have those uh, chips to bargain with. Yeah, the options disappear quickly. Uh, you, what I used to do sometime would be to call up somebody in the unit or if I knew somebody that worked for the company to get to find out what, what is the starting salary usually uh, depending. Uh, what is the starting salary that they're willing to pay? Or what are people making? And if you know someone in the company, that's very helpful too. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, would you like to read one of your strategies? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, I won't read it per se, but I would say to you, be a listener first. In this world today of employment, of work, you have to be a great listener. You cannot just think you hear something from either a client, a coworker, a boss, and you're going to take it all in. You have to be a good listener. You have to ask questions today. It is so important to ask questions. That's active listening. Active listening, absolutely. And you cannot take anything for granted. Most people today in the world of work, they don't just do task A, finish it and do task A again, finish it and do task A again. They're constantly on the move, so they have to know the cycle of the workflow. That's very important too. What work do you do and where does it go when it leaves your desk or whatever? Very good. Um, so you said you're gonna read, read some of it? Okay. Uh, let me go to something called Strategy number 15, gossip monger, curse of the classroom, curse of the workplace. As I reflect on my years in high school, I don't think I gave too much thought about the world of gossip. Of course, there were always rumors going around about who was dating who, or what teacher was seen knocking back a few pints of suds at an out-of-town grill or whatever. But I digress a moment. During high school and at my part-time jobs during and after school, I added a few words to my somewhat limited vo vocabulary. Mean, cruel, vicious, vindictive. Mind you, I was not one to say, excuse me, guys, I'm walking away as I don't wish to be part of this scurrilous and deflammatory gossip. Heck no. But now I came to learn a valuable lesson. Don't be first, don't be last, don't loan money to anyone, and don't be a scuttlebutt butt shark. What does that mean, Jack? Well, in the world of strategies, you have to be so careful with your mouth. You have to be very careful not to be a gossip. 
You never want to get a label pinned on you because that's where hurt, pain, and tears occur. And now I'm talking to some other students and I say, I'm as your mentor, I want to set the tone and let you know that spreading rumors and malicious gossip can be trouble, especially in the workplace. Let me give you an example. I'll use names like Dick or Joe or G Jane or Mary. Mary joined the company Bowling League, which met on 12 consecutive Thursdays at 6 p.m. Since it was too far to go home and when work ended at 4.30 p.m., she and her friend Jane went with Dick to the pizza shop next to the bowling alley for a slice of pizza. But Mary always had a ginger ale and two slices of pizza. pizza. On three or four of these occasions, Jane didn't go for pizza because she had to stay at work and would go to the bowling alley later. Yep, you guessed it. Halfway through the 12-week bowling session, Joe started with an unfounding, scandalous rumor. Hey, I see Mary and Dick seem to be cozy on the, on the bowling lanes. They go out for pizza a lot. They're both married, but you never know, and you know what they say today. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. I won't continue reading more, but I'm here to say to young people, especially today, you have to be very careful. Don't be a rumor monger. Don't spread rumors. Don't listen to rumors. And be very careful. Very careful when you're dealing with coworkers. Because you might, you might just say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, definitely. Um, that's very important. Never talk ill or bad about other people because it does get around. And you want, and then when you're talking when two people are gossiping to each other, well, they're saying, well, what's he saying about me? Absolutely. Behind my back. So you definitely want to avoid that. Um, sometimes you do have to bring up an issue, but it doesn't have to be personal. And uh, that's a separate issue. Very good. Um, one last uh, strategy you want to share with us before we close the show. Yes, uh, very much so. It's called Start a Love Affair with Your Dictionary. It is so important today. I'm not kidding and I'm quite serious. The dictionary is a jewel of a book. You really need to have the ability to talk to customers, the strategy to know what's going on, to say the right words. You cannot always rely on your boss. Early on in your schooling, you need to build a vocabulary, which over the years will serve you well, regardless, regardless of any future endeavors. And, uh, and now's the time to do it. All your life, you will converse with others, be they family, relatives, friends, co-workers, teachers, professors, employers, colleagues, and many others. And you need to do so in a very professional way. And by golly, you need to be an active listener, acutely aware of what you're saying and what other people are saying to you. When I was young and throughout my years in elementary school, I always looked to my mother to do my homework. Mm -hmm. My mom was a great source of information. But little by little, as I had to start writing papers in the eighth grade, freshman year of high school, etc., I would say to my mother, Mom, what's this word mean? Mom, what's this word mean? And little by little, my mom had to wean me off of that statement and say, it's time to get your dictionary out. And I started early on with a dictionary. And to this day, I have two big dictionaries at home. One is a Ramden, random house, and the other is a collegiate. And every time I've looked up a word, I always put a little red check mark next to it so that I know I've been there before. Well, over time, I did learn to use the dictionary. In fact, you might say I started a love affair with the dictionary. And to this day, every time I come up with either a word, a meaning, or a spelling, I put a little symbol of red ink next to it to say that I've been there before, in case I have to return to that word again. If today you were to flip through my somewhat 
tattered dictionary, you would see hundreds upon hundreds of red ink symbols. And that reminds me when we used to have the Reader's Digest. We had the ten words of the day you had to look at. And Remember the Reader's Digest? Absolutely. Remember those ten words? Yes, yes. And the matching, oh, it's called for too. Better, for better vocabulary or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Try to match Remember words. That. Well, that was a very interesting show. And we, as we do in every show, we have you sign over the book. It's my pleasure it's indeed. My pleasure to have you. And I wish you a lot of luck. And uh, people really, I mean, you really do know how to get your act together before you start a job. And it's just like will make your life easier. So it was my pleasure to have you here and continue teaching other people how to succeed. Thank you. Isn't it uh, something, though, Jason, because we've learned from our own mistakes, we're trying to help others. Well, that's why we have on. this book now, because that wasn't around when I was trying okay. to find a job, entering the working workforce. Actually, I found a job right away by entering the workforce and getting along with others and going up the ladder and succeeding, you do have to have these strategies. Right. And even if you're guaranteed in your job, you still want to have a fun job. So Absolutely. You need those strategies. Thank you ever so much. My pleasure.